Who is it we want to, who are we going to talk to? We need to know that. Who should we talk to? Do we need to connect Trooper A with Firefighter B? Is that really interoperability? Do we, probably not. Do we want to take primary fire channel here, the primary fire channel from another agency, and connect them together? No. It's going to lead to confusion. All right. Is there a rare instance where you may want to? Yeah, there are. It's the only channel that that guy has, and you need to use that. It's the only one that works there. Okay, yeah, there's, there are exceptions. As a rule, what do we want to use to connect for interoperability? What do we want to use? Mutual aid frequencies or tactical frequencies? IHOP channels, you know, interoperability channels, tactical channels, whether they're simplex or repeated. Separate talk groups up here on trunking have separate talk groups for your interoperability. If, and really, what level should interoperability be working? In a command structure. At the top of the command structure. The interoperability, even if we go back to the Trade Center and the Pentagon, you know, and back past that, you know, the interoperability issues on most of these major disasters is Commander A talking to Commander B, or who, their comm guys usually, right? Because it's usually not this, right? The comm guys pass in that traffic a lot of times. But it's command level here to command level here to command level here. Where did Unified Command come from? And I say yes, what was, where did it develop? It came out of interoperability. It's, that was the basis of it. Why do we have unified command? We need to get everybody together because we don't have good interoperability, right? So we need to get the people together. So everybody's going, well, we don't need to be together now. We've got interoperability. We got Nation 1000 last week. You know? No. You need to have that unified command. All right? Is the unified command going to be there 100% of the time? They may not. Ideally, they are. There's a representative, but at the very least, if they're coming together for the briefings, they're coming together for the ops and the train, you know, the ops meetings and the decision making, and then you have the capability of interconnecting the command staffs. That's where interoperability really pays. And I, I don't care if that's at a state level, local level, citywide, or disaster. That's really where interoperability needs to be. Now, there are, of course, exceptions. You know, if you have State Trooper A buzzing down highway, whatever, and he can't talk to the local PD and the you know, they're going to that local town, is it nice to be able to have the dispatcher flip switch A and B and to get the trooper talking to the local PD? Now, should the, the local PD be on the main ops channel? Probably not. They may be. That's your local decision. That's part of your, your band plans. And, you know, figuring out. But ideally, when you go to a pursuit like that, you know, you still have your regular city to take care of, right? The world doesn't stop because of the helicopters following a OJ. Right? So you can do those types of things. But you know what? How long is a Motorola center, uh, center, 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 center <coughs> console been able to cross connect two channels? Forever, right? You've been able to do that forever. You've been able to take system A and system B and connect them together. Nothing that's been around for this. many, many years. Probably 20 years or since day one of the console. They've been around a long. So that's nothing new. Does it get used? Did it get used? Did people promote it? Did people figure out how to make it work effectively? No. But because a lot of times they didn't have the state frequency at the local county level comm center. That was the problem, getting that, county, that state radio in the comm center so it's on the console. And then whatever system you're using, you know, you can do that cross -cut. And Now, is that interoperability? Yeah, it's, it's still interoperability. How should we talk to them? You know, Bravo 21, Charlie 54, you out there? Is that what we're going to do? State trooper calling local cop? Is he even going to know what the other guy's call is? 10 4, copy K, QSL, Metro. And I really never did find out how that got started in Metro using that. Must have been a hand in charge of the company. Um, 
Do we want to use codes? No tag codes. No designators you may use because you get, you know, still, you may only know that person by a designator. But you don't want to be using, you know, 1021. All right, what's a 1021 to anybody here? Phone call. Phone call, anybody else? Anything different? 10100. Supervisor. Supervisors, a bomb scare for us. Restroom break. Restroom break. Okay, 13. 10-13. Man down, officer needs assistance, pull out all the stops, hit the panic button. All right. Okay. So you can see how the confusion develops, and that's why as soon as you start talking out of your agency, I mean, pretty well, it really is not There's some use in your normal day-to-day -day with certain codes, of course. It makes life simpler. Uh, but when you start dealing interagency, that's you've got to train your people that that goes out the door. Right? We 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 all have radio numbers and, and stuff. When we get out of any operation, we go like national parks and the same thing. Train, get rid of the designators. Uh, you know, Barton and Lemoyne. All right, Barton and Colin Lemoyne. Plain English, oh, call them by name. It's less confusing. Because you, if you start using the codes, people just don't understand. You know, or the different codes. And, and you can see what can happen. If I call a, a 10-100 and it's an administrator or a P break for him, I'm calling 10-100, 10-100, 10-100, I need, you know, I need DOD. You know, I need DOD for a P break. <laughs> so you can see. Keep it simple. Plain language. Is there an operability box with switch? It may be. It may be. It's another tool in our bag of tricks. Okay. Is a radio in each hand? What do I have? Stereo. Stereo. <laughs> I got VHF. I mean, you can look at the antennas. It's, it's not 100%, but generally you can. You can pretty well look at somebody's radio. This is not so much, but that could be 800 or 700 and get up in there. They kind of get, they usually get a little bit shorter. But, uh, you know, I got UHF here and I got VHF here. So, uh, and on the human interface, correct. So, we did it for years. Human relays. We sent a guy in a truck up on top of the hill and he would, you know, task one to relay, you know, we have a fine. Uh, relay to task one, ten four. Relay to command. Command, task one has a five. Yeah, you know, command to relay. <laughs> it's cumbersome, but you know, you still talk, right? Um, from a command standpoint, I mean I've many, 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 many times in incidents, you know, one rescues is walking around here. Oh no, you missed a cell phone. Next up. I carry routinely this, VHF, UHF, AT&T, with AT&T push, anybody use an AT&T push and talk? Try it, seriously try it, we'll talk about it. Next L, because, you know, we're heavily embedded with law enforcement, fire and have the next L in our area, like a lot of areas. I love next L, I think it's a dying horse, unfortunately. The next L will be next L. It's not next L anymore anyway, but radio wise it, right? Is it is next L cellular? Yes, no. it's just two way. It's two way. It is not technically it is a it's it's trunk radio with a phone interconnect. <laughs> really, that's what it is. It's that's how how it was designed and set up. It functions just basically the same because they made it into like a cellular type system. But it's it's really a uh, interconnected trunk radio system. Um, and the IDS system's great. The old Nextel was great. Saved a bunch of time, a bunch of lives as far as I'm concerned. In 9-11, they came in at Katrina. It's the only thing that worked when I got into New Orleans. It's on top of the causeway, one of the bridges. You know, it's the only thing that worked. Sprint dead, rising dead, mobile dead, everything else was out. And they came in, and I'll give them credit for credits too, at t was great at the Trade Center. They brought a cell site plot to cell site right at the, at the landfill and gave us phones here. Gave us a bunch of computers. You know. 
So, I mean, all the carriers really have great response programs. The next I have to say, the old next was really great. Have given out thousands and thousands and thousands of work of phones, you know, and, and wrote them all. Um, but they, one of the things that they did, very smart in their disaster plan for Katrina, they did not provide cellular or phone interconnect, cellular or phone service. They provide push to talk, direct connect. That's all they gave us. I lived with it, was happy to have it, because that's all I needed. I could now talk, and I could talk back to, back to Pennsylvania, I could talk to our other units. Right? We had a remote at Nextel in our trailers that we caught in there. So, and the reason they did that is why? What's the valuable commodity at that point? Bandwidth. How much of a connection, how many sites do they have coming in? If you put somebody on voice, you're tying up that channel. You got two people talking where you can have a whole bunch of conversations theoretically going on at the same time on data with a push and talk. Okay. Short messaging, you know, that was another big one. You know, that's traditionally, even through uh, the, the Trade Center and that, Pentagon, uh, the voice overloads, you know, this, this, is cellular really a viable tool in the disaster? No, we've seen it. I saw it at Bridgeport. We had to build a class at Bridgeport. The press came in there, and that was in the analog days. They came in there with their mobiles, and they put them up and had them up 10, 20, 30, 40 hours at a pop. And if they disconnected, they brought up because they got the thing up, they grabbed the channel, put it up, and kept it up, paid that money, so they had that, that connection. Up. So you now the carriers have wised up. The biggest mistake we never really implemented, and you know, they're trying to do it now, and Nextel has it available is the priority you know, program. We had that on the old analog on the AMP standards where you can set the user priority. Well, you know what? Nobody ever used it because you know, if you put a fireman at a high priority and he's calling his girlfriend and you have the housewife who's pregnant and having in labor and she's at a low priority and that ever got out, what's the lawsuit? Because he's just he's not using it for emergency. There's no way to turn the emergency on and off. And even still today, they have it going. Well, they do on the next hell. They can. Um, I'm not sure on AT and T if they're doing that. The next hell can, I believe, turn their priority capabilities on and off by AT and T. I think AT and T has Gets cards. What's that? Uh, AT and T, you can apply for Gets cards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can. You get a, um, a. It's a card with an authorization. Basically, is what it is for AT and T. And there is a sailor co a company out there where you. Set up your own cell service, GSM. Yeah. Back call it via any ISP. Yeah. Into a non-disaster location. There. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about some. We'll talk about some of the uh, PicoCell and IP based cyber. Um, you know, so radio and each hand pre plan Really, that's a lot of this is always pre you know, EMA guy. You get sick back from about pre plan but it's. That's the business. That's what saves your, your butt in the end. Same thing with the comp. Yeah, yes, it's all that more. That's all that more. All right, we talk about a whole bunch of those. You got the Vega, NCS, uh, ICRI, you know, Homebrew. Uh, you can buy this on, uh, buy those on eBay. That's two cables. That goes into the base of a, or under the plate of an ICOM radio, and the other one off. There's another one here goes into the other radio. That's your crossband. That'll do your crossband, or you can do repeat, depending on how you set the radio up. And I think it's about forty, fifty dollars. <coughs> it works. Now it's down and dirty. You don't have a lot of audio controls and no delays. And, but to do a real simple down and dirty, if you have two mobiles in a vehicle, you want to be able to do a crossband so you can connect your fire and your police together on the scene on a chief's vehicle, it can be that simple to put that in um, and with a switch. Uh, NCS makes a real nice uh, <coughs> four channel, I think it is, <coughs> box that you can hook four radios in and you can interconnect them right in your vehicle. No IP. Down and dirty, five six hundred dollars. They're probably here at the show. Uh, ICRI, they'll they'll be here this afternoon. They'll show you how that works hands on. Uh, they do have a, this is their new software for their IP connection in. 
That's the unit. It's uh, five radios, a phone, and a handset. Um, they've, they've got a lot of those out in the military. Very reliable. Very simple. Um, works well. Good audio. Okay. All kinds of cables. You've got good cable support. You just figure out and uh, get order the cables that you need for the people you're dealing with. And you, it has two talk paths. So you can have two pairs of radios talking separate audio paths you know, on it. Uh, you can get that configured. You can get them configured up to big systems and racks or simple five channel in a, in a Pelican case. You can mount it in a vehicle. If you've got three or four radios in a chief's vehicle, throw that on it. You've got really the interoperability, and, and, and it's where you need it because if you've got to change the train, train that chief. So he understands that if I'm going to bring the police up, I'm going to bring, I'm going to put my fire channel or my fire tack or fire ground onto a police tack. You know, and there again, that you've got to have these pre-planned out ahead of time, so everybody knows what's going to happen when it happens. There's the transcript. That was the original box that came up with back in the uh, '80s. We sold it forever and ever. I got very disheartened and disgusted with transfer. Your bunch of money hungry grabbing bop 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 that unit used to sell for a few hundred dollars originally. Um, they have no development in it. I don't know what the development was. I never got a dime out of it. Uh, neither did Gene. Uh, we got a couple free units in the original days. They have a newer version now um, that you can do your cross banding repeating and you can link another radio in. A little bit nicer, a little bit of a little bit extra capability, real basic. Um, it's really, you know, it's the type of thing you're going to set up like a uh, wildfire situation, you know, where you're going to have uh, a repeater and then you want to throw it maybe a VHF on, you know, your fire frequencies and your fire guys out there and then do a UHF link back to the command post or something or to another agency. Uh, but their price. That from a couple hundred, from a couple hundred dollars, two fifty, three hundred bucks, I think originally, uh, the packages went up right after nine eleven. All the you know interoperability, right? That thing just a couple thousand dollars. They repackaged it, complicated. And I called them and asked them what they were doing. So anyway, we all got to make a living. It's just how we sleep. And you can see what it'll it'll do. Uh, you, know, you can do a P25 link here, connect that in, and depending how you configure it, you can do repeater, you can do uh, different configurations. To do. And for the money, it's still it's it is it is really though designed for very very fieldy type applications because it's just a little box. It's not good for mobile. It's not good for site, anything where you got other transmitters. You can't use mobiles, you don't have to. I mean, all this stuff, most people show you uses portables. It's really not the best radio to use on any of this stuff. If you're going to put a JPS in your command post, really a, a bunch of portables sitting on the counter inside your command post is not really the best way to do that. It's the worst way. First off, you're putting all the air inside, RF inside, and are you really getting good comm, comm outside? You know, have mobiles pre-wired if you're doing it in a vehicle. Ideally, have your JPS in there, it's all pre wired in. Um, the, uh, yeah, I just went blank. Department of Environmental Protection, U.S., got a bunch of uh, comm trucks last year. They've been spreading out to the different regions. They have JPS in them, they got the Daniels repeater. And that. But there was no, they wouldn't, there's no training involved. They got to, a lot of these guys got this thing and just had no clue what to do with it. I know, I know one that's still sitting there, never used it. You know, they use the truck, they take it to call, they use you know, the computers and stuff. And, you know, they, they still don't have a clue as to what the interoperability is supposed to do on it. You know? So it's unfortunate. You know, it's, it's great to have these toys, but. 
got to go through the training. And unfortunately, in this class, we can't do it. You know, I mean, that's, this class was originally intended to do that. Uh, here, it's, it, this environment is hard. But I don't know. Let me ask a question. Would people, would there be interest in this type of a class, more of a tech? And we have a mix. We have some administrative and corporate and, and that here. Uh, would, would there be interest in a really a tech level, probably a two-day class, to really, and I mean have the equipment and really run you through doing it and putting up antennas and, you know, getting your hands dirty type class. Put your hands up, please. Thank you. Put that on your, if they really look at the evaluation, I have to say, this was the second highest attendance class last year. It would probably be in that same, either this highest or the second highest this year. And I had one person complain, and I'm not the best presenter. I'm a crop class. But I, I have been teaching as a chief, and I've been teaching a lot. I, I, you know, I try and give you information that's down to earth. I'm not really here to sell you anything which one trying to educate people to say, well, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. And on the ground, I, you know, I'm out getting my hands dirty and getting up there and here, so I don't do as much of the running as I used to, so I'm trying to do more consulting and getting this word out. So well, if you put that on your evaluation and say, more technical hands-on class would be of interest, that's good for me because I can go back to them. I tried to do that this year. I wanted to do what we're going to do today, and then the second day we get hands-on. Bring, really bring people up to a technician level from what our program would be a you know, contact one technician level. But I, I need to do that in two or three. If you're interested, we can do that in our own area. We can set up a class and do a two or three day class. <clears throat> Satellite comm. Uh, really got going with Emersat. There was a couple of military and some other projects. Um, Mobile Satellite Adventures, which is out now, has a the system that's been around a long time. Those were the, really the two first ones. Uh, the uh, MSAT, anybody using MSAT? Two or three. Um, it's sort of a dying horse. They're coming up with a new generation new system. We had it there at the Trade Center. It was the only thing that worked. We had one in the truck and we borrowed a portable. And it was the only comp coming out of Chelsea uh, on Tuesday night. And, uh, we used it up at the landfill. It was the only phones coming out of the landfill for the first three or four days that we were there until AT&T brought the cell in. Uh, works good. The nice thing about it, I push the talk. Well, I love to push the talk, right? Okay. It has that. It works really well. You can talk all over the country with that push the talk. Uh, they promise on all the old gear will work on the new satellites. What's that? The MSB is promising all the old MSAT gear will work on the new satellites. Yeah, that's, that's their promise. We'll hope, hopefully they'll do that. I used to be a, a dealer, and then five or six years ago, right after 9 11, I think it was. And um, most of the satellite companies, unfortunately, are not conducive to disaster <coughs> communication. They're starting to come around, some of them. But how many people here have a budget to buy? And we'll talk about the vegans. How many people, have, how many people here have a satellite? Link, probably data of some sort on their units. Anybody? Okay, you got to pay. What do you pay in a month? Sixteen hundred dollars a month. Sixteen hundred. Good heavy system. Oh no, fifteen. Fifteen. I mean, the cheapest, like Motosat. You go Motosat, and it works. I mean, we use three Motosat terminals during Katrina, and they were great. Not real high capacity, can't run voice over IP on real well, they're not fast enough. Uh, they have some, the F3s that have come out, we've got some newer systems, higher speed, that will do voice over now. Um, and they're 100 bucks. And we had a company bought us those, we took them down, we had them, we saw them on the trailers, we'll have a picture of them here. And we ran data, and data, you know, data's better than nothing. I mean, you can do a lot of communicating with data. So, we had them set up all over the place, and we moved them around, to, you know, we set them up in the relief center. They'd have something else come in. We pulled it out, moved it around. So the satellite is great. The problem with it is, and you can usually get the funding. There's a lot of funding that'll let you buy satellite. You know, global. How many have a global store? Any? Eh? Still using them? Yeah, not working. <laughs> They're working. Yeah, they claim they'll send you a schedule with one of the working satellites. Yeah. It's, actually, I've had 
you know, out of an hour, I probably have 10, 15 minutes downtime. So, yeah. I mean, you can't run continuous ops, but if you're out in the built, out in the woods, and you want to make a phone yeah. call, you wait a few minutes to make a phone yeah, call. You wait. They're not, their global stars have some problems with their satellites. They have some amp issues. Um, the, the spot, and we'll talk, we're not going to uh, I've got a time to go a lot. Spot, uh, these are available all over. Um, Star Store has them, it's one of my sites. Uh, $149, right? It uses the Global Star system, the data only system, which is not affected by the problem. The end. Different, different part of the setup. Um, it's a tracker, it's a one way device, it's a GPS receiver and a one way satellite of uh, 16. Megs, I think it is, uplink to the gold star. Okay. It sends, when you activate it in sequence, it sends three bursts timed out. Theory is one of the three will hit the satellite. Okay? No acknowledgement back, so it keeps transmitting. Right. Seeing how much global star here, we're stuck with what's going in the dumps there. I don't think I'm buying anything else. Global star, well, they're, they're, they're scheduled to launch. They're going to, unless they don't have make it happen fast enough. Uh, but the, all the indications are they're going to salvage the system. No, you? Or not? No? You think they're going to get down the tubes? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. I mean, all they got left is a simplex data system, and they, they screw millions of customers. Yeah. They don't have to like they launch for uh, a few spares that they made, and they made the originals. And right. Yeah, but they have new generations. They're supposed to be going to be launching new generations of satellites. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know. It's hard to say. This is a hundred and forty-nine dollar investment. And if they go down, if they go defunct, it'll make a nice piece for the mail. If nothing else, it will save lives. It already has saved lives. It does work good. You will at least get a few years of service because they're not going to go away that fast. Satellites will be there. We're going to do something. Up. There's, they do have a very extensive data network that's out there and is being used, and they have not lost that part of it. Um, but it's, it's $100 a year for emergency service. You hit the 911 button, it goes into the 24 hour center. They take your GPS location, they know who to contact. They contact the service and tell them that they're getting a 911 call from that loca GPS location. They have all your personal information in the computer. Uh, it's already saved two lives. They one was in Alaska uh, last December. They launched this in November. And a, a guy that was a caretaker at a facility had one of these. His family bought it for him because they were worried about it. They sell them with the satellites and nothing up there. Uh, I think he used HF, from what I heard, and that's unreliable. Um, he was outside uh, doing some work, had a medical problem, hit the 911. Coast Guard guys came in. I think it was Coast Guard guys came in. Did you hear that? Uh, came in. Helicopter came in, found him right on the, right on the money. <laughs> Facility pulled them out, saved his life. So that was the first save on this one. Um, it also has a track for another fifty dollars. So for one hundred and fifty dollars a year service, you can push the track setting. It will give you twenty-four hours of tracks every ten minutes. All right, and it comes up on Google Map. It's all you need: web interface, and you can take a look at. You'll be able to see where they've been, where they are. It has an OK button. You hit the OK button, it'll send out three sets of OK signals. The OKs, uh, the track information just goes into your account. The OKs will go to my phone. If I had service, if I hit the OK on this, my cell phone would ring, and I would get an indication from this unit as an OK. This unit is sending me an OK. And that's a, that you can set up on the computer online and send it to two or three email addresses. So if you're out hiking, I mean the audience is hiking, you're marine, and it, the advantage is it's not based, it's not like an ELT. It, it gets your GPS and sends it to the satellite to the provider. Um, it's a great little unit. It's very. It's about 85% of the signals get through from what I've seen. If you're sitting still, um, in other words, if I set that outside, because it doesn't hit every single pass on the satellite, it doesn't miss some of those 10 minutes may miss. But the theory is when you hit the 911, this goes into a five minute mode. So every five minutes it sends three signals out. Do the numbers. You know, you might miss one, but generally within 
a few, you know, five, 10, or 15 minutes, it's going to have at least one hit into the system. And then it'll keep sending. So even if, even if you have a major problem, medical problem, you keep traveling, it'll keep sending. If you get them, the only thing I found is get them up. <coughs> if you're fixed, <coughs> if you're a fixed location, get it out in the open. You know, give yourself the best odds of hitting the saddle. And you got a little subtract. Um, and we're that standard in there again. It's, you know, you can get uh, fixed terminal little like laptop units for a bunch of different units out there. <coughs> and you can get phone service with that for, uh, and that's about two, two bucks a minute, depending on how you get the plan. So. And they're two to three thousand. You can buy them for three or four hundred dollars on eBay used. We have two of them. We keep cash on activated. But even if you activate those, like, you can keep them activated for 30 minutes. The last one we had it on. We use that Katrina, and yeah, it worked well. Okay, so that Iridium. How many people are using Iridium? Yeah, yeah, they got a good deal. Iridium gives you all kinds of benefits if you trade up. Bulk I think I actually got a usable Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Use some facts. Data. They do work for data. Uh, it's slow data though, so <clears throat> but you can get emails and uh, monitoring capability. Uh, anybody heard anything? I tried to get an update from them on the push to talk that they were talking about last year. Uh, I think they were primarily going on the military with it. No. Anybody seen anything? Heard anything? Yeah. It's. Uh, Basically, they're trying to do a push to talk uh, type function through it, somewhere to like the next help. It does have low speed, Iridium, Global Star, MSV, Qualcomm, all that. They're all low speed data terminals. One of the first times satellite data was used in an emergency, as far as we can document, was a Qualcomm terminal. For right after Hurricane Andrew, we had a Qualcomm terminal. That we uh, were trying and we took it down with us and we were at the school in Homestead and that was our only communications out of there. We were passing, you know, everybody, Qualcomm is the system that uh, the truckers, the really set up for truckers, they were trucking in, but it's basically just a little data terminal and you can send the trucks and track the trucks. It's still, they're still using it, they've updated it. It used to have a RAM receiver for positioning back when, when we had it. <clears throat> and it, uh, we were passing uh, requests for Broward County for the medical and their triage center set up. We were handling communications logistics for them. And we would pass, they'd give us lists, and we would send the list, type the list into the computer. It went to the Qualcomm's Op Center in San Diego, I think it was. And they would uh, then take that and forward it, fax it out for us. That was probably one of the very first times data was used at a disaster uh, as a public safety function of a disaster. That was, uh, that was Andrew, 91, 2. Please feel free to go out to these facilities. I'm just going to keep going. I've got about 30 minutes before lunch. <coughs> this is the BGAN. It's, it's one of them. There's a number of units out there, a couple of different manufacturers. It's a nice unit. It's, it is high speed, depending on the package you set up. Um, nice and compact. It's got a battery. You can uh, do Bluetooth telephone for voice over IP to this. You can uh, Ethernet out of this one. And, uh, do uh, local area network and do a computer or multiple computers. <clears throat> the antenna is will separate from the pack, so and it's, it is basically water resistant. So you put this outside and bring it in, bring it in, or you can separate the antenna. Um, 
these are, I've seen them down at the $1,200 range. Now, <coughs> for that unit there, um, service, you can buy a SIM card like you buy through your phone form prepaid, so you can or you can sign up for it. <coughs> And as you can see, you get on some of them clearly, it gets pretty good speed. I mean, you can do streaming video. <clears throat> Same thing a lot of the news agencies are using to get remote video out. You'll do your short messaging. Um, USB phone. You do voice. Uh, you can connect your, you know, PDAs. Whatever. You go hook it up to a wireless. <clears throat> it's not cheap. I definitely wouldn't want to put that up and do an open access point on it. You'd probably uh, have a bit of a problem. Um, many of the systems you can run fax on, either a data fax or a standard uh, group three type fax. How reliable it works. <clears throat> It's a spot, $149. They're available all over. So, depending how we bring our data in, what we do something like with the track star, DGAN, um, system we set up down in uh, New Orleans, we brought uh, high speed from uh, Sprint um, out of Baton Rouge. Microwave it all the way down into New Orleans, up to Side L and over to Hancock. And then another system came from <clears throat> east of Hancock over into uh, Hancock and then was distributed off the tower, the water tower in Hancock. Uh, the trailer, you can see the motor sat and set up. Gave us decent uh, internet access. Uh, that's basically a consumer RV version. See how the fish. They have an F3 now, this bigger, more powerful transmitter, one watt. I believe it is, or two watt, I think it's what you know. <clears throat> And you can run voice over IP, radio over IP. We can actually run radio over IP with a, with a VPN client. Right on the limit area of it. It's, it'll run the radios, it'll run the Telex Bay over that. <clears throat> this system that was portable, that, that went all over the place. The National Guard had it for a while, uh, St. Tammany and uh, Seidel had it for a couple weeks, uh, feeding their mobile command post trailer with the uh, internet. Um, New Orleans PD, this is a well, it was a Crystal Palace. It was a uh, sort of like a, just a big meeting room and a banquet hall. It was up in the northeastern part of the city. <clears throat> and that's the police station had been flooded out, and this was high and dry. So they took it over as that regional uh, command area for that part of the city. And the PD, uh, PD federal agencies, everybody worked out of there. Some of them were sleeping there. You know, we didn't have anywhere else to go. <clears throat> had a relief supply. So we had a uh, motor sat up on the roof and brought it down into the building, provided Wi Fi. Um, the radio resources guys had donated computers from different groups that we got brought in and they were uh, configuring computers and bringing them in, putting them into the relief centers. We put uh, four or five of them in there, which gave them internet. I mean, they, <clears throat> Nextel's did not work there. There was no coverage in Nextel. None of the carriers worked there. Their radios were primarily run at Simplex. They have to walk outside a lot of times to use the radio. Uh, so when they got the internet in, they finally had an internet connection back to headquarters. So they could at least do email and handle reports and stuff like that. It did eventually, we got it up where they had access into their record system. Uh, so it was, it was a lifesaver at that point. This is week two and three months in. And that was up and running there probably, uh, it was up for about six weeks. And then they finally got some trailers in and moved in the trailers. 
That's part of the link, uh, the back hall coming out of Baton Rouge. Uh, that's a 130-foot uh, rapid deployment tower. It's got the two uh, five-gig dishes on it. That was pointing to Baton Rouge that way, and that was pointing down to the Actually, I mean, there was other towers, and it was one of about what, five, five or six hops, I think we had to And there was no tower we could get in the middle, so we had a number of these. Uh, we brought down 130-footers uh, and some 100-footers. And we found the guy's yard of business and went in, told him we want one to do, and he said no, pa no problem, and he actually had uh, generator in that so it was good. We ran UPSs on it to back up the generator if the generator went down. And, uh, when the second hurricane came through we had recorded wind speeds of um, 65 to 75 gusting, I guess it was 75, <clears throat> where that unit was and never lost path. Pretty good. So it was better than I, ex I expected it would probably lose path during the storm. But it never lost the path. And some other things, and this is things to think about, is how are you going to maintain your data? I mean, how many, how many people use data? How do you file your reports? How do we communicate? Uh, so much of it is now done with data. What happens when, you know, your Verizon card doesn't work, your Sprint cards don't work on your laptops? You know, how many, how many people are you using like Sprint EVDOs and that type of stuff in the command list? Two, three? What's everybody else using? Are you using a few? A couple guys had satellite, right? What are you using? Are you using computers in the field or not? No? Yes? No? Okay. Well, the Sprint EVDO cards are great. Verizon, Verizon works better, I think. <laughs> Bigger area, Sprint's kind of limited. <clears throat> and we had it last year, I, I've had a dispute with Verizon and Sprint on their practices. So I, I do not have a unit here this year. We had one. But I will tell you, and against what they like you to know, uh, the EVDO cards, uh, Sprint actually pushed it, I don't know if they're still pushing it last year. They, and do they still have them in the monorail, the free Wi-Fi? Anybody see it? And it's, it's a Linksys box with an EVDO card plugged into it off the Sprint network. And what it does is it gives you a 2.4 access point using the EVDO. Anybody, if you have it open, anybody can access that. Great box, works really well. The Verizon and Sprint will work in each other's box. There's a uh, D-Link has one as, out as well. Uh, you'll see that in a second. You can plug that card in. That'll give you decent especially if you're in an EVDO area, it'll give you decent data speed at your command post. And you can, both of them have removable antennas, so you can put an external antenna outside the, you know, outside the building or outside the uh, vehicle. This is Wayland up here, the Wayland Water Tower. It survived, it's a commercial cell phone tower right next to it. It survived, although the electronics was shot, it was everything. Uh, they're getting 20 to 30 feet of water through here. Uh, this is the shed. The shed survived. Or jumped a little bit. But, uh, mounted a box, and there was a five sector 900 megahertz uh, system up there with five, uh, five sector access points all the way around that. Um, there was 2.4 gig access points just flooding the general area with free 2.5 access. And we do with radio, radio response group was doing a, uh, they were bringing equipment in, providing equipment to the schools or relief places. This was the way we call it the Wave One Cafe. It was a, uh, I'm not sure what the actual group was, but it was, if there's any hippies left in the world, it was, it was basically some, you know, down to earth, uh, natural foods, okay? group of people and they were great. They fed uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, meals after meals for a long time. So we did a hop from the tower into here, 900 meg, that was on a pole outside the tent. And the guy set up uh, 
basically a little internet cafe and that was open to anybody could win. Because what do you do? If you don't have a phone, how do you do your banking? At least you can get your online banking, you can send emails to friends. It was a big comfort to a lot of people because there was no phone service, period, at all in there. And they would bring these uh, 900 bed cops into all these different locations in the area. And we did 2.4 accesses then at most of those locations. Here's another hop. This is the water tower uh, with five gigs coming in from the back hall. And this was the electronics. That whole box ran five 900s and three, uh, I think three 2.4 access points. And it was all just Cat5 dice. It was nice to have because they had an enclosed uh, ladder of safety. On it. <clears throat> so the guys went up and they had the rail all around it, so we were able just to mount the, all the accesses right to the rail and run the cat bike. This is at Site L. It was the, uh, one of the churches on the main drive just before the bridge going over the uh, one into the worms. And it was, they had a very large relief operation there. It was the major one in Site L. And a tent with all the relief supplies, uh, cooking operations, uh, Salvation Army, a number of uh, the religious relief operations uh, were there. Uh, there again, right in the Red Cross. Uh, was multi agencies running, it was huge. Uh, no communications when we first got in. And uh, the police department, uh, and said, you know, hey, can we get some, you know, can we get coverage in here? Well, we had our other trailer feeding their command post, and they said, you know, can we get something up there? So we brought the little trailer sitting right there with the mast up, and that was a 2.4 access on the top of that, had the motor sat feeding it. See the wire running. They ran a wire up to the. Um, this picture is taken from the top of the school. The wire went up into the school, and then we dropped another access point in the Red Cross office of the Red Cross because they were doing their ordering of supplies and equipment. <clears throat> and they loved it. They had a global start fixed from the outside. I think it worked that way. Dave, were you involved in? Are you back here? Were you guys involved in that many with your time? Yeah. Dave, I think Dave and Bo Jay here both did some stuff for Red Cross. Um, and you can see the guys would come out in the front hallway because the, the trailer was right outside, plus the, the Red Cross office was around the corner there, so the best coverage was right in front of the building there. So a lot of people you can see would go up, the different organizations would go up and send their emails and order their supplies, and let people you know, send personal messages. So they go up there, and there's a picture of their guy there, and a the guy there sitting there on their laptops uh, using, the, using the access. So what else can we do if we set up our own local network? Um, here's one company. Um, Wave has a communicator that will work on a PDA or a Windows 5 that you can do some of this with. But this is a phone system, it's basically, and there's, there's a, probably a couple other ones, but they primarily have their own proprietary system on this one, so it's not standard 2.4, it uses a 2.4 band. But it's, it's basically, it's a phone system that you can use um, with access points in your command post area, in your command post trailer, you can remote that out, so anywhere you can be dropping your access points or meshing, you could be using these as a command function for telephone and, and inter-command communications. So you're going to see a lot more of this stuff coming up. DBS, uh, you know, like your direct TV and that. Uh, how many people have direct TV on their vehicle command or anything? Are you using them? Up on the back. I'll tell you, we've, we've been using it for quite a while, pretty well since it came out. We've had some sort of direct TV dish and receiver. Uh, CNN, you know, best info in the world. Uh, we just have to take a little bit of grain and salt sometimes. What's it telling me? Um, but it, it's handy. When you get in, you can set it up and still have a connection with the rest of the world that's going on around you. Some of the high speed internet, the 
provider. That's Dave, that Florida is one of your best Floridas. Yeah. Where was where was this? Yeah, the, the picture down on the bottom right is the Baghdad Airport. Baghdad. Um, that's the uh, combat camera that's going to be deployed. I think uh, uh, close to a thousand and a half. Yeah. So one on a vehicle. The day we'll have a little bit more of that in this presentation. Something I'm working on right now, and um, got a raw great capability. Is there's some uh, there's some major uh, FCC issues, of course, because <clears throat> how many people are using bidirectional amplifiers in any applications? Anybody? Anybody admit to it? Uh, a lot of controversy. You know, it's bidirectional amplifiers still using frequencies that are controlled by the carriers. And if you're going to deploy bidirectional amplifiers, you need to have the carriers involved in it, at least involved in it, and proven to be 100% legal as it stands right now. <clears throat> um, the next step above bidirectional amplifiers, and you can use them for your 800 trunk, that's a different issue because if you have your own license, then you can do that. Um, next step above that is IP based cells. And they've been around on major, you know, carriers have been using them for a number of years. <clears throat> but now they're coming out with the Pico cells and the Femke cells. And the theory behind it is Sprint, is Sprint is testing this now, I think, in California. Anybody have this going in their area, Sprint? Um, and the theory is, is if you have a high-speed interconnect in your house, you can drop a router basically the size of this or standard Linksys router in your house. Plug it into your ISDN cable, whatever your connection is, and you can, with that, connect back to the carrier's switch and get, you know, basically you're getting, of course, an increased range. So there's a bunch of possibilities. They're looking at that you can use your cell phone, and they know when you're in your house. That's one of the issues is they also know when you're home. Um, when you're in your house, your phone will talk to that instead of talking to the tower, and that will adjust your rates as far as what you're maybe getting charged. It takes loading off of their system by putting it onto your internet connection and not theirs. So there's an advantage to them for that. Um, it will give coverage, like in your, you know, if you have structures where you don't have phone service, um, it'll give you coverage inside of the structure. It'll handle, uh, as a rule, four to five phones at one time. It'll pass your EDO. It'll pass your short messaging. Uh, it's basically you have a little cell site and a little teeny box of very low power. But it will give you contact and communications you know, within 50, 100, 200 feet, depending how it's set up, of that unit. What kind of possibilities does that open up for disasters? Big time. I mean, I'd, I'd be thinking about killing people to get this. Um, there's a, it's like, huh? There's another company providing a GSM type network. Out of 200, Florida. 200 phones, and you set up your own. Yeah. From your mini cell cells. Yeah. Legal. It back calls back into, yeah. if you're, let's say, AT&T, because GSM, it back calls into AT&T's network, so AT&T's actually handling your yeah. network, your phone calls, and your data, and so Small Unfortunately, that's you can use it because that goes through ITS. It's government. There's some government frequencies, and that's the only way they get. That's the way they get away with that is for the government, the federal level. They can do that throughout Florida. I her name is Gal. That's it. Uh, works great. Basically, it's your own little cell system and package deployable. <laughs> works wonderful. Uh, they're getting there's free, federal frequencies to run that on that they're using it. There's still some issues, I think. <coughs> told the other day before class about whether or not that's going to continue or not. I'm sure it will because once we got it, we're not going to get rid of it. We need to expand that into public safety is what we need to do. Because how great is it, you know, to have your satellite system and be able to plug that in? Because if, if we've lost all our cell, my, my argument is, well, if we're wiped out like in Waveland, there's nobody on the air. We're not going to interfere with anybody. There's nobody there. Okay? So, how do we, there again, it's pre-planned. How do we pre-plan? 
Why is there not frequency set aside just for this use? Because nobody thought about it. Um, so how do we develop a pre plan and come up with those frequencies to use that? So um, kind of push a little bit now on AT&T uh, to come up with this. And uh, it's been like hitting your head against a stone wall for the most part. Uh, a couple people have got me some information. Uh, Shirley here. Never did look up here. Um, it's, it's all an issue of who owns the frequency and the carriers own it or control it in the area. So it's a matter of getting them to come up. And I feel we're going to see it. They, they all have great res emergency response programs. What we need to do is migrate that in, uh, down to a county level so that you can have one of these hooked up to your satellite or any other system as a backup to give you coverage when you're out in the woods and don't have it or if your systems are down. Um, the other advantage is you can control this. If you're overloading, you can kind of hop around the overloading that we see in disasters with this if it's done right because you've got your own access and you can control that access in your command post, come out with your own link and you're bypassing everything that's going on locally and going back into the network for your character. So you can hop and that's just like your map. It's just plain and simple. And what happens when you know it hits the fan? The cell phones load up. They're, they just cannot build the capacity into cellular to handle all the calls that happen during a disaster, and it never will happen. So here's a way we can, from the public safety side, kind of get around it. So the voice quality is better. Your EPDO is going to work better because you're not sharing it with as many people. Uh, it's got a lot of advantages, and hopefully next year we're going to have some positive news. How we can deploy it from a public safety standpoint. Right. I think I asked, nobody's using the uh, push to talk on the AT&T. Verizon? Verizon? Didn't work well. Uh, I really would encourage you to look at AT&T's push to talk. It is, it's uh, available, it's a limited number of phones. Uh, some of the benefits are the big thing is, is you've got, you can see who's available. You're available silent, do not disturb, unavailable. Uh, invitation pending if you're trying to add it to your group. Uh, initiate, initiation of progress, and then uh, group icon is two pairs. Uh, I can set up a group on my phone on the fly. All I need is your phone number, and even if I don't know your push to talk, I can enter your phone number, but if it is, it'll go through. If it's not, it's just going to reject it because you're not in the push to talk system. $10 a month, unlimited. And if you're on plans, um, like my plan, I have three phones. I pay $10, that covers all three phones. You pay $10 for the first two phones, and after that, it's included. That's a good deal. Yes? I have a question. And, uh Limited phones, unfortunately, I'm, I would hope that they would push this. They should be pushing it with what's going on with Sprint. I don't understand the philosophy, and I'm hoping I can find somebody here at the conference and peg it to the wall. Uh, Blackberry is what I got here is the curve. Uh, they got a Pearl, Motorola is what she has. Uh, there is a no, uh, Nokia out. I'll get the Nokia. Not, I mean, Nokia's aren't too bad, but the Nokia with the push to talk, the audio is louder. Uh, LG, I have not tried. All three of these sound great. The Motorola, um, to me, is, I don't know, I just like the audio. This audio is nice, it's clear. Um, I'm not a big Blackbird fan, I but I uh, wish they would expand it out. But it works good, and uh, the, the reason we looked at it is we never really ever did get Nextel to give us good group function for our team. When we went to Nextel, they sold, oh yeah, you'll be able to talk to everybody. Because we cover 14 counties, so we don't have a radio system that talks everywhere we want to talk. So we thought Nextel would be the way to go. We never got Nextel hooked up the way we wanted it to. There, in the beginning days, you didn't have national, and then now you still have to pay extra for national. It's included in here, national. Thank you for sticking it out, and I hope you picked up some helpful information. Please like it, if you do. And if you subscribe, we will send you an Awareness Level Rescue International Comtech 3 certificate by email.
please email your information and your subscriber name from YouTube to director at rescueinternational.org and help us reach our 500 subscriber goal and hit the notifications button to stay informed of new videos. Thank you for watching from Bruce and the crew. We will finish off with a few final words about pushover cellular or LTEPTT. One of the big things I've been trying to find, because what, you know, if we got this, what's the next great thing that we can add to this? Because it's IP based, bring it onto a laptop or a desktop computer, right? And I mean, and, they, and they, everybody, they promoted it in some of the literature that they can do that. Nobody's got a clue on how to do it. Have you, are you doing that? Have you come up with anything? Um, I'm not part of that team. I don't know how far they put the data on it. All right. If you could get my card, if, if you could, I really would like some help on that, if anybody else does that. Because that would be the next best thing, because that's always been one of the problems we've had in the like next step. It's how we get into our comp section, right? So you had to do these things. We'd take the phones and interface the phone to a console. And well, if we could do it on a computer, it would be really simple. Same thing for disaster. Like voice instant messaging? Yeah, you can do voice instant messaging. They have that function. You can do, you can do instant video. I have done it. It's like a video thing you can do with it, too. Uh, it's available on basically, well, it's GSM on AT&T. You can get, it's available on other formats. It's, I mean, push to talk over POC, push to talk over cyber. It's, it's all similar in that it's, uh, it's a, the most, or they're all basically still based. The AT&T more features available than CDP. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, you know, we, it does not seem, that what I've tried on, like, on, uh, I did see a sprint version. And it was, it was a little bit slower, I thought. You know? um, the, the, the big thing is, in theory, the interoperability on this is we should be able to talk between systems with this. It's, it's IP based. So it's a matter of everybody getting together in the same room again and come out with the standard.